John, all right. Um, hello. So uh, I've come from Monash. Uh, Friday morning I was in uh, Melbourne, uh, Australia, and so it's been a fairly long trip. Um, what I'm going to tell you about is, is our research in, in uh, research we're looking to do. So I'll give, this is a fairly, uh, this is a story. Um, there's actually some results in the middle of it, but it's, it's a story about where we're going and what we're doing. Um, so, um, and just by the way, one of my roles at uh, Monash is uh, I set up the Master of Data Science, which we have. Um, uh, we've got an awful lot of students coming from China. Um, is my speaking okay? Is everyone catching me? Sh should I slow down? Yeah, I used to, at various stages, uh, it's okay. Yeah, all right. So, I used to have a strong Australian accent. It's now a mild Australian accent. Yes, that's the result of living in the US for 10 years. Um, so, I'm director of the Master of Data Science, which uh, we set up the program two years ago. Um, and Australia now has huge numbers of uh, Chinese students doing master's degrees for some reason, and it seems to be propping up the university sector financially. Um, I'm not sure how long that'll last, but uh, it's keeping us busy. If I can figure out. Ah. So, motivation. What are we doing and why? That's the first section here. Um, big silicon, big networks. Big graphs in, in software engineering. This was, I don't know, uh, no, none of you are as, well, it looks like none of you are as old as me, but this is how a neural network looked in the late, eight, late 80s when I was doing my PhD. And each of them is a node, right? So now you've got deep neural networks, which of course, are a lot bigger. They're huge things. Um, I have no idea what this stuff is. It's just, I picked it off a plot somewhere. It's a big network. Um, I wanted to explain why I'm talking about deep neural nets because I won't discuss it all in the lecture. Right? That's not what we're covering. But uh, several people I've chatted to, for instance, uh, Alex Smoller, who's the director of machine learning, or he's the research director at Amazon, uh, other similar people, they're saying, why is deep ne neural net so successful? Well, of course, there are many reasons, but one of them is that you don't need to do a lot of programming to a degree. You're writing code in Python or a lot of it. But a lot of the hard work of getting stuff going on a GPU is actually done for you. There are people who've written all of that code and you're setting up some Python blocks and it will then compile the code to work for you. That's how a lot of those systems work. Inside, they're what's called, have what is called auto-differentiation, which is where the the derivatives and various other mathematical routines are actually generated automatically from the specification of the, of the network. So if someone has a modelling language and they say what their network looks like and it is then compiled for them. So this works very well. Um, so this interests us and, and um, we would like to do a similar thing. Now we also have networks. They're not as big, but we've got networks too. They're probability networks. Um, and we have a lot of interesting models that we work with. What we'd like to do is do what the neural network guys are doing, is have someone in a specification language write out their model, and then we'd like to compile the model and then run it for them in the same way that the is works with neural networks. So that's where we'd like to be going. These are the sorts of problems we're addressing. Uh, Twitter, analysis of Twitter data, bibliographic data, 
social networks. Um, our networks, though, are probability models, and I'll talk a little bit about them later on. Um, and there's quite sophisticated statistics underneath sometimes. Um, there's a lot of other research groups that are doing similar stuff. Um, but what we don't have is good support for the generation of the software from the models. Uh, though there is some related work which we'll cover in a bit. So this is, this is the problem we're looking at. Um, I'll just give you an example of some of our networks. Later on, I'll be attempting to explain the parts of some of these networks. But for now, I'm going to flash up some slides that I pulled out from previous talks. Don't be fussed. You're not supposed to understand it instantly because I'm not explaining it to you. All right, I just want to show you what some of our networks are like. So this is actually a document segmentation model. The W in the middle, that's words in a document. You want to find out where the breaks in the document should be, where the natural breaks should be. Um, uh, as it happens, this network is the network for the best document segmentation algorithm currently. Um, it's a fairly complex network. We'd like to be able to compile it. We can't. This was a, about a year's programming for some poor student. Um, this is a topic model with side information. So here in the middle we've got words again. Here we've got features about a document. That's what this grey node is here. It's like the, the author, the subject categories. And the other grey node G, that's the word net or word embeddings. It's features about words. And we combine those three things, the documents, features about the documents, and features about the words into a model. Um, this one is going to be uh, published at ICDM in November. Uh, it's in New Orleans, I think. Um, this is another one. This is a very good clustering model for, for tweets. Uh, we have... Um, follower information. So this is the follower graph. That's the author. Over there we've got the hashtags and the words. So we model the hashtags and the words separately. The author has their own hierarchical model and the follower network is used as well. And it does a very good job of tweet clustering. So this is another model, network model, we would like to compile and we believe that we can achieve this, though we're in the middle of working on this. So, this is the kind of data we like to work with, just to show you the sorts of data that would be driving these models. Um, you should all know this, it's a typical ACM page for a paper. Uh, which one? Oh, this was our paper back in 2014. So there's all of this lovely information that you can build a graph with. Authors, institutions, journals, keywords. And then you've got what's called uh, unstructured data, which is the abstract, all the words in the abstract. So with that, you can make a graph with multiple nodes and multiple kinds of arcs, multiple kinds of nodes, a very rich graph. Um, this is usually called semi-structured data in the computer world. Um, <coughs> though it can also be called sparse matrix. So you can represent it, of course, as a matrix or a graph. We tend to mix them up because to us they're the same thing. You, if you're a computer scientist, you sort of know what I mean. Um, but this is the sorts of data we're dealing with regularly. Um, not huge, like the, uh, the first graph I showed you was a Pentium chip. That is bigger. That's now maybe 100 million nodes. We'd easily have 100 million words, but we wouldn't have 100 million authors in our systems. 
Okay, this, I don't know how well this comes up, but this is the result, this is an example of uh, the sort of document summarization we're doing uh, with our models. Um, this one actually has a, a hierarchical model where these are the background words. These are non-topical words and the rest of them are words with some relationship. Um, so, but this is actually on my website um, if, if you're interested. This was the sort of thing we're trying to get the visualisation guys to do with us. So that's just a, an overview of where we're going, but motivation. We like to build these tools to take these networks and compile up programs um, to turn network or probability specifications into code. We like a decent range of models and fairly good algorithms. This we're currently looking at. This would be later, but this is something everyone wants to achieve. So we know Amazon is very keen to to do this kind of thing. Uh, so, uh, you know, some of our students could go to Amazon and, and work with them on this aspect of it. But, uh, <clears throat> okay, so that's our um, uh, motivation section. Now, just to note, um, sometimes I mention uh, critical phrases and I'm using this just to say, if it's in green, little w, Wikipedia is a good reference. Now, I actually think Wikipedia is great, but for about 50% of what we do. Um, other stuff, Wikipedia is no good. So you do have to pick your battles when you're using Wikipedia. So I've tried to mark the stuff that I think Wikipedia is a really good reference for. Um, okay, prior work. I'll now cover the prior work that we've seen that's in this area. Um, so, there is actually quite extensive prior work in taking probability graph specifications and creating algorithms, um, which we'll have a look at. So, I know about this because I built some of the early stuff, right? And I also recognise some of the early stuff. So, I've been doing this for quite some time. This was a... Uh, um, this actually paid for my housing loan in uh, Berkeley, California, which, believe me, wasn't cheap at the time. Um, so this was working for NASA. We built something called Autobase, um, which was a great idea. We never quite got enough time on it, but it was, it, was a, uh, it was a nice idea that is similar to some of this. So this is an example of someone's specification language. This is, in fact, Linear regression, simple linear regression. Beta zero is, it's a, a normal variable, a Gaussian. Mean zero, standard deviation, 001. Eta one, that's another normal variable. So they're describing the model. Here's the linear regression part. It's simple linear regression. I didn't want to put up the complex stuff. They do factor analysis, all the other different models you can do in this but this, this one is easy enough for us to get. So this is an example of a, of a, this is actually a graph, you can set it up as one of those graphs I showed you, um, uh, with the nodes, and here you've got a, a, a vector, vector nodes. It's for simple Bayesian linear regression. So these are the priors, these ones here. Um, everything is defined, all the constants and parameters. Uh, this, this one was actually built in, in, um, in England. In this system was developed in uh, the early 90s. Um, very famous. Uh, Bayesian inference using Gibbs sampling. Have I got? Yeah, bugs. Yeah, the inference has disappeared. It's Bayesian using Gibbs sampling. Obviously, they wanted a good acronym. Um, what it does is it runs a simulation. So the guy who, who developed this, the, the original developer, um, he had a professor who was the developed the language and everything, but the guy who actually built the system, he wrote a stack-based compiler, rather like Java, um, which worked for 
um, probability languages and did Gibb sampling as its, as its task. Uh, so this is the method they're using, if you haven't heard of this. I don't know how many people have. Monte Carlo Markov chain. That's just running a simulation. That's all it is, running a simulation. But they're using a specialised version which is very simple called Gibbs sampling and what it's doing is a local search. It's changing one variable at a time. It's doing a simulation, changes a single variable at a time. So their stack-based compiler is going to generate this set of variables and it's just going to do sample beta 0, sample eta 1, sample tau. It's just going to go through these and that's what their system would generate, code to do those sampling. Um, now, this one is famous, Bugs is famous, uh, uh, revolutionised the application of statistics. So there's whole sections of conferences in statistics that, that do this stuff. Um, that's not all sweet, you'll, you'll see in a minute. It's not a happy ending is, is what, what's going on. Um, it re and bugs really is the origin of, of the use in machine learning of, of Bayesian networks. So uh, many machine learning papers have a Bayesian network in them sometimes, giving it as a model. It all traces back to these guys. They started everything. Um, so these are the different versions currently for this. WinBugs is this early one developed in about 93. Open bugs and, and jags. Um, this is the only one surviving currently. So um, this is what happened. So um, uh, God, I forget the guy's name. Um, uh, we worked together in, in Helsinki for a while. Um, this is his phrase. This is what he says. Who's ever heard of component Pascal? Anyone? No? Not me. I never knew it existed. Why did he write it? It's the language he knew, right? He wasn't a computer scientist. He somehow picked up component Pascal. And this is what he says. If I knew how to code Java or C++, I wouldn't be working for the Medical Research Council. I'd be working for a bank. Couldn't get a job there, so I got a job at Medical Research Council and wrote bugs, which became the most famous statistical program around. But it was written in a hopeless language, so the development died after about 10 years. People just couldn't develop in this strange, antiquated thing that, that someone had done and no one used. Um, so that was the end of that, right? But the JAGS guys kind of went on and, and they wrote it in, in another language. Um, interesting story. But actually the main developer in here, he's now um, Sir David Spiegelhalter. So he did pretty well out of this. He did a bunch of, a bunch of other things. Um, He's the uh, Professor of Risk at Cambridge, funded by, he goes on TV shows and quiz shows and things. Uh, uh, sort of, he no longer does this sort of statistical stuff, but this is one of the many things he did um, that revolutionised statistics and got him a knighthood. There you go. Um, so after this, something called Stan came along. Uh, I know about Stan because one of my students went and worked as a postdoc there. Um, so I got to know some of the group. Um, they had a big advantage. So it's a different kind of language. It's a little bit different. They had computer scientists helping them develop it. So it's actually done very well. Done really well. That's a lot of the early statistical code. Um, uh, there's problems because they didn't have computer scientists developing the systems. Uh, but this was done by proper computer scientists in collaboration. It's done at Columbia University. Um, so writ all written in C++, um, using a system called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, uh, which is not something we can use. We looked at it for a while, we can't use it. Only deals with real values. All of our data is discrete. Words, graphs. So we can't use any of this stuff. It just works on vectors of real numbers. 
um, which covers a large class of statistical problems, but it means we can't deal with it. Um, so that's the, the background where we know people have taken probability networks and compiled up code. All right, there's these two systems that are very successful. Huge flexibility. I and mean, just you look at some of the programs they do in their user guides, they're just really impressive. But it doesn't really solve the problem. Um, there's really very, the support for discrete data, which is what we're playing with, isn't really there. Um, they don't do the real tricks that we do to make our algorithms work fast, which I'll be talking about in the middle of this seminar. The tricks are called collapsing and augmentation, but I'll talk about them. What it means is adding a node or removing a node to a graph. That's all it means. So we can add a node and remove a node and make a much faster simulation. Um, speed it up by a factor of 10 with the right kind of work. Um, also, they generally won't scale up because the clever tricks they need to do that they haven't written. And that really is computer science work to, to make this happen. And the developers here are, well, in the Hamiltonian guys, they're busy with their stuff, but they're not, um, they can't deal with our kind of data anyway. So they're not really a problem. So we know there's prior work. We know this stuff is very helpful, but it's not really useful for what we're doing. So now I'll give you a bit of an introduction into some of the statistical background. Quite simple. I'm not going into heavy stats, but I just want to give you an idea of what we're playing with. <coughs> so we'll look at two things, matrix factorization um, and Bayesian network models. So matrix factorization, an example of that is PCA, principal components analysis. A related thing is factor analysis. They are some of the most commonly used statistical routines on the planet. A similar one is ICA, independent components analysis. So they're widely used. So I just want to briefly mention this because I'll be showing up some factor analysis problems in a bit. So this is just a, an illustration. This is actually out of a nature paper. I'm pretty sure this is a nature paper written in 89 um, that kicked off the non-negative matrix factorization and to a lesser degree the topic modeling um, community back in 89. So you've got the original image up there and there's two different, three different matrix factorization versions. One is, um, is the Gaussian one, this is PCA, it has negative data. It allows negative factors in the model. Doesn't work very well for faces. Then we've got what's called vector quantitization. Now this technique is the basic technique for old school speech recognition, image analysis, loads of things. Um, it's probably used inside cameras. Uh, but what it does is it does clustering, k-means. It runs k-means, gets a set of centroids, uses them. Each of them is, is which face is this? Well, it's nearest to this one. It's matrix factorization. It doesn't work that well, but it's, it's commonly used, one of the early ones. This is, but this is what non-negative matrix factorization did, which, which sort of revolutionized things. Um, the thing is here is it allows only positive uh, components. So the two parts of the matrix are positive only. This and this, they're only positive. And that seems to give a better ma match for certain things. So while it works for pictures, we use it for words. And this, in fact, is a topic model, if you've heard of that term. So in this case, a characteristic part of the face might be the eyes, the nose. In this case, we've got a characteristic set of words about royalty, one about schooling, one is just a set of stop words. We mix a combination of them, 20% of them, 10% of them, and we get a bag of words. And if I showed you that original news article, it's a story about Princess Diana taking her kids to school for the first time. 
royalty, schooling, English names. So this is the basic setup that we deal with and, and the data is, is uh, words. It can be in different ways. Sometimes it's word counts. So while this indexes the documents, this might index into a dictionary. Um, so the ith document, the first word. And then we've got the we're going to approximate this by two low-rank matrices. Um, one is typical word sets, like we saw there. So the far one, the phi, is this guy, typical word sets. Oh, wrong way. And this one here is the mix of topics into the document. Um, now, in PCA, they're basically doing a least squares. But if you've got count data, integer data, positive data, you can't, least squares is not very good. So you can use other matching methods. Um, uh, you might use a callback Liebler distance. Uh, there's other ways of doing it that work better. And that's where we have problems. So that's a summary of all the different matrix factorization approaches. There's many different ones. Non-negative matrix factorization, the one we do a lot of is the middle one, Poisson matrix factorization. Topic models um, and ICA. So they're all similar. What they vary is the constraints they allow on the, on the content. Okay, that's matrix factorization. Now we'll have a look at these graphical models because we'll have a few more later on. Um, I won't be uh, going into these in too much detail. Um, so, here we have variables, x1, x2, xn, data. We've got n identical, identically distributed data. That's the parameter that gives their distribution. So rather than having a big graph like that, we put it in a box. So this variable here occurs n times. And this is basically repeating it. So this is a vector. X is a vector of length n. That's what this is saying in this graph. Um, so we go all the way back here. That's what these graphs were. See the, this is a matrix because there's two, two boxes around it. Who started all of this? These guys. They had all of these graphs in their, in their uh, user manuals. And then it infected the, the machine learning community. It hit NIPS in about 1995. ICML, those communities, and it was the, the big thing for about 10 years. But it all started back with these guys. They would draw the graph and then they'd have the... Um, why do we do the graph? Because that gives us the structure. Well, you know, you, if you're a computing guy, you know, it gives us a structure of the, of the system. Um, and sometimes the graph is all we need to figure out the algorithm. We don't always need to know what's at the nodes. Uh, so that's why it's, why it's there. A lot of our processing, a lot of our techniques we do operate on the graphical structure. And then there's some little bit at the end that operates on the node content. That's how it works. Okay, back to our graph. So, um, and then if we're a statistician, we'll say, well, theta is generating all of these data x. If this is a Gaussian, you can turn it around um, and say that, well, all of this data X gives you a total count, uh, some statistics that are computed from the data. So that's just another way. All right, so now we'll be doing more complex models of these, but this is building up. 
This is a supervised learning problem. You're predicting x from, uh, well usually it's the other way, you're predicting z from x. But it, so this is both data, this is a generative model, right, like a naive Bayes. You're, you're predicting x, you want to predict z from x, but your data is such that you're generating x from z. In this one, this is a clustering model. Your cluster is unknown. Your cluster value is unknown. And it's generating the data. So we've got supervised learning and unsupervised learning. These are the models we'll be dealing with. Now, if you haven't quite got this, it, you're not going to miss out that much. Don't worry if, it's, if, if you're missing the detail. But this is our clustering model earlier. Now I'm going to add to it the parameters because this is just telling us what the data looks like. We've got a latent variable and a vector of data. And the parameters of that model are that the latent variable is generated with a, say, a, a probability vector. And the data might be generated with a Gaussian, a multivariate Gaussian or something. So these are parameters of the model generating the data here. Now we're going to up the complexity a bit. This is just a simple vector of data. Now we've got words. We've got L words in a document and we've got I documents. So it's a matrix as we saw earlier. So this, this is representing the problem we had earlier. There's a matrix of data there's K, the dimension of our side of our matrix. Um, we've got the vectors on one side and the vectors on the other side. And here it is back in the... Um, here. There's our matrix of data. We've got document vectors this away and word vectors this away. So the, these are the word probabilities and these are the document probabilities. And here they are on the graph. Oops. So the word probabilities and the document probabilities. Um, now this is giving the, the actual distributions underneath. Um, which we don't need to get into the details. I will, I will be giving you an example uh, later on, but this is just to show you. Um, and normally, there's sort of two versions you go here, different levels of representation. You've got the graph, you've got the actual specification as probability statements, and then you'd have the bug, something like bugs code that would be the text version that we type in, whereas this is the math. And the bugs code would try and do that. Okay, so that's the, the technical background part. Um, now I'm going to work through a few examples. Oh, did I lose my... <laughs> yes, sorry. It's so warm, I was expecting Moscow to be colder. Really? Is it hot? Yeah. It is. Oh. I lived in Helsinki for many years, and if it was this warm, in, this is a summer day in, in Helsinki. Yeah? So, that's only for half of the summer. Um, worked examples. So, we're going to work through how our algorithms would work with what I was telling you earlier, collapsing and augmenting uh, on a couple of problems. One of them is a real problem. This one was, is, uh, we've just done this paper and the other one is a, a, an example problem, but it is quite, it's realistic what's going on underneath. So we'll look at the core part of the ICML paper we did. Um, and then we'll look at a, we'll just work through a toy example, but this works in large scale because I've, I've coded this one up about 10 years, uh, 10 years ago, I think. Um, 
But here's the, here's the idea. How do we make an, a graph work better? How do we make our simulation run faster on a big graph? And what don't these earlier, uh, these earlier statistical tools do? What they don't do is remove and add nodes. Removing a node in probability theory is called marginalizing. But in sampling, it's called collapsing. God knows why. Uh, but that's the, the name people will use. Um, adding a node is, well, it's, it, usually it's called introducing a latent variable. I should have put that down. But in sampling, it's called augmenting. This is also called Rao Blackwellization. Just in case, if you've done a second year stats course, you should have heard that term. Rao Blackwellization. So, but adding and removing nodes, and we'll work through an example. So the first one is topic models with side information. Um, here's the reference. Um, as I was mentioning before, uh, documents, useful information that we can use in our analysis. Position in a classification hierarchy, key phrases, author. It's all useful information that can help us pin down something. Words. Words have amazing prior information we can employ. WordNet. Um, deep neural networks, we've now got these embeddings, which are pretty handy to use. So Glove is the one we used. Um, so all of this background information we're going to use to enrich our analysis. <coughs> Here's the simple version of the topic model I was showing up earlier. It's just written in a different tool. Um, what was this? This is written in, I don't know how to pronounce it, T-I-K-Z. It's a LaTeX authoring tool. The other one was written in uh, some strange, uh, very early thing. But uh, <coughs> we've got our words, <coughs> matrix of words, right? It's there's two boxes around it. It's a matrix of, of, of words, which means it's documents, and each document has a vector of words in it. Um, the words have background information that we'll build in. We'll build a model for that. And the, the documents have background information and we'll do a model for that. So that's what we're about to set up, these two models here. Here are the formulas for the original topic modelling that matches this. We haven't added our side information into this yet, but up here we've got the two alpha and beta in blue, which are the bits we're going to model I was telling you about here. Document side information, word side information. So these are the, there's the model for the matrix data, I've written it in two ways, and there's the model for the, the document matrix, the document topic matrix and the topic word matrix. And they've got parameters which we're going to be prov building up from our background knowledge. Um, and there it is. This is how we're going to build alpha. Alpha will be a product of bits we're going to build up using Boolean features we, we get from our whatever our background information is. So the, the subject categories, the author, it just goes into maybe a thousand booleans. And then we've got a thousand of these guys sitting there. These parameters. And if a particular author is on this paper, there they get a lambda for it. If it's about um, uh, molecular biology, they get a lambda for it, a particular lambda. So whatever booleans are on in their document, they get the associated lambda goes into their alpha. That's the model we're using um, with these distributions. And the rest of it is just the previous topic model. Um, so this is what we've added, the bits here and here. Um, 
Now, what I'm not going to show you is what the original people did back in 2004 to get this graph working. So in 2004, Griffiths and Stivers published an algorithm that works for this graph here. And what they're doing is something called collapsing. And it's called the collapsed Gibbs algorithm for LDA. Um, I will show you the formula for it. Here's the formula for it. Why am I showing you this? Because I want to show you how hard it is. Not because I want you to understand it, right? You haven't developed it. But what it is, it's a bunch of gamma ratios. Gamma mm. is the function that, that generates a factorial. Um, so this is the likelihood term for the alpha vectors. So these guys here, the document side information. Um, sorry, wrong way. So this is what the, the, from the data, this is the likelihood we're getting according to these guys' algorithms back in 2004. Um, and our problem is we want to be doing some learning on these alphas. But they're buried in a complex function. Gamma is a horrible function. Well, it's, it's pretty clean, actually, by mathematical standards. But it's buried in here, and we can't do anything with it. Really slow. It's, if, you do, if you put this on a, on a standard optimizer, you know, a newton raphson or, or a gradient descent or something, it takes a lot of time, and it doesn't work very well. So we want a better algorithm. Um, so, there's tricks we can do. And the tricks we're going to do is going to get rid of these complex functions by augmenting. And here I'll show you what we do. So, to do Monte Carlo Markov chain on these functions here is very hard. Um, very slow. We want an algorithm that's going to run quickly on millions of parameters. You know, the statisticians think we're crazy because we really do have millions of parameters. They never usually wouldn't have more than a couple of hundred. Um, like deep neural nets, we, we have these massive networks, millions of parameters, and, and our algorithms cannot operate with this sort of thing, so we need something to do a better job. So this is what we came up with. Um, There's a distribution called a beta distribution, and here it is. I've written it out. And if I set up my beta distribution in just the right way, it's going to match up neatly. Here's that, the left term. I'm calling it gamma ratio 1. Here it is. Here. And I'm going to just add in, I'm just going to toss in, pick a random variable this Q. So I'm going to augment. I'm adding a new variable to my problem, Q. But it's got a distribution that just happens to cancel out this thing here. There it is. This part and this part. So if we multiply the right-hand side here by this, we get a wonderful result. Simple in alpha. Have a look. There's alpha there. That's the only place alpha appears. It's a nice, simple exponential of alpha. All of this stuff doesn't have alpha in, so we can forget about it. We don't care. Because what we want to do is sample alpha. So by introducing this Q, we get rid of these horrible things, and that's all we got. A nice, very simple formula in alpha that we know how to sample with. But that's only one side. And there's two. There's another ratio we have to get rid of as well. So we do another clever trick that's similar. Um, it's called a Chinese restaurant distribution. So you've got to have a lot of these distributions sitting around and you, you pick up this. That's part of what we do. We gather distributions and put them in a table and, and pull them out for different occasions. And so this one has the gamma ratio in the other direction. And so when we multiply that nasty gamma ratio by this probability, 
We get another simple thing in alpha. It's got this, it's a bizarre combinatoric function, but we don't bother because it's disappeared. It's, it's a constant. This is the bit we're trying to sample with alpha, and it's just occurring as a power. Great. So these two augmentations, by introducing T, we sample according to this Chinese restaurant distribution. And Q, which we sample according to a beta distribution, both of them are simple ones that are fast and we have code for. This is what we end up with. This function here. We end up with this wonderfully neat distribution in alpha. This is a Poisson likelihood. And the Poisson is, is one of the basic distributions of, of, no, it's a gamma likelihood, sorry, I tell a lie. So this is a gamma likelihood. Um, and it's an easy one to work with. But remember, we've got a more complex problem because earlier on, before we got to alpha, we're actually going to rewrite alpha as a whole bunch of lambdas. And that's really what we want to be doing our learning on, them. So if we replace, do a rewrite and just pop this in wherever we get an alpha, we get another formula that is still a simple formula. And there it is there. Um, the thing about this is, uh, it's a, it looks like a lot of things, but there's a lambda here. The other lambdas are hidden in this alpha. So it's, one is appearing exponentially, the other one is occurring as a power. So again, it's in a gamma form and we can, it's simple, it's easy for us to deal with. So that's, that was our contribution, right? That's what I did. I figured this out in about May and we knocked up a, a paper and we got a couple of papers out of this. That's what you do in, you know. Um, but it works amazingly. It just works incredibly well. We were just amazed. Ten times faster than all the algorithms. I'm not going to go through this. Um, uh, th this is... This is our happy line that, you know, everything's nice and dandy and everything works. It's a nice happy ending here because all our numbers are, are less than everyone else's numbers, right? And that's good. So I'm not going to go through the details, but we did an awful lot of experimentation here. D actually, I, I will take a side excursion there. Um, that's one of the big things about machine learning, right? Um, our models are complex. Uh, we, we really need to be writing algorithms often and testing stuff. And we need to compare properly. Because, at uh, I don't know, 20, 30% of published work is, is, doesn't always hold up over time. Because the experimental, w it worked really well on these two data sets that they, they got. They didn't try other data sets or something. You know, machine learning is a tough empirical field. Um, but so we did a lot of testing and, and this was there were some good algorithms around but you know I, we were just amazed how well this worked um, we had a bit of fun with it though the the, the fun is um, anyway this is what happens we start with this complex formula we do our augmentation and look what we end up with all the complexity disappears that's with our augmentation and all of this we can automate we know how to automate this so we'd like to put this inside a system um, I had a bit of fun with this from the, from the reviewers, right? Uh, so, great results, but, you know, it's too simple. And, uh, yeah, I was going to have a rant, but I didn't. The, the students stopped me, you know, in the response thing. I was going to rant about just how stupid this was. but um, Too simple? You know, people have been doing this problem for like 10 years. Yeah. No one's published it before, and it works so much better. You know, sure, we agreed it was simple. It is simple in hindsight. Everything's simple in hindsight. But anyway, th 
the, the people who said excellent results, they managed to... Because we knew, we knew it was simple, so we had to do really good experimental work to sort of carry it through. You know, uh, anyway, this was kind of, I found this very entertaining. So there's some reviewer somewhere who sort of got burnt because they got over, overridden by the other reviewers. So. Anyway, I'm sure there's more algorithms out there like this, but uh, <coughs> this one really was, it really did impress, impress us because we've done this problem a bit, just how well it worked. Um, okay, change of, quite different now, we're looking at a similar problem. This problem is about n-grams. So in language modelling, which is when speech recognition people go from phonemes to text, they want a language model that's going to say, well, these phonemes probably don't go together because there's not a word that matches that. So it doesn't have to be a great model of text, but it's got to be reasonable. And they were in, they've usually been called language models. Now, the state of the art these days is, you guessed it, deep neural nets. Um, some really interesting work done there, published this August in, um, at ICML in Sydney. Um, but one of the very good methods that still beats deep neural nets in terms of speed is just good old n-grams, which is where you've got a big table and you predict this symbol given the previous, say, 10 symbols or 20 symbols. And it's a big lookup. Clever data structures, a bit of stats underneath. Um, so that's what this is about. It, it's showing you a very simple model for this. Uh, so here's a simple hierarchy we've got. And we're gonna, we've got a probability hierarchy. We've got you know, a probability vector about words you could have in a book. Then there's a probability vector about words in the chapter, which is going to be more specialised. And then a probability about vector about words in the paragraph. So you've got a hierarchy of probability vectors. There it is. So we're going to build up this model. What we're going to have, though, is data at the nodes. So we've got, we've got our word data at each of these places. And the reason we're putting the hierarchy there is we're going to use information, and this is basically going to get, let you share information. It's going to say that, well, the content of this paragraph is probably similar to what's in this paragraph. And it's not that similar to all, at all to this paragraph over here, because it's in a different chapter. So the hierarchy is used to share information. And this works very well in n-grams, where the hierarchy is three words back, or four words back, or five words back. So here is the model, statistically. It's a Dirichlet. This, this one is di distributed Dirichlet, this one, the leaf node, it is distributed Dirichlet, but this probability vector here has this probability vector as its mean. That's what this says. So this one has this as its mean. But if you put these together, <coughs> do the stats and come up with the, the functions, this is what you get. These horrible gamma functions come out again. <coughs> and it's very hard, you can do it, but it's not very fast. And it's certainly not going to work on, you know, hierarchies of a size a million with um, gigabytes of text. It's just not going to work. Trying to deal with these sorts of functions in a, in a system. So we need something better. Um, so we'll do the collapsing. All I'm doing is working through the, the basic things to illustrate to you how this works on this problem. So here are our, here's our hierarchy. Here's our data here <coughs> in these boxes. We've got a bunch of words at each node, and this is a probability vector for the particular node. So this is everything. We've got our root probability mu, the second level theta 1 and theta 2, the third level p1, p2, p3, so on, and then the data, which accounts. And so it's a probability and accounts for that. So this is 
the, the probability model, the likelihood written out, just a direct match for that graph. Hmm. Um, this is what we do. So we simplify this graph. We do a whole lot of collapsing and augmentation. We get rid of all of these probability vectors because they're real valued and we turn them into counts. So we collapse them out and then we augment back in a bunch of counts. Pretty much using a similar trick to what we did last time. But that's what happens. And this is basically what we end up with. So it's a similar hierarchy but these are count vectors. So instead of being a probability vector of size 1,000, you're going to have a set of counts there instead. But most of them are going to be zero, so it's really easy to work with. So that's the, what the collapsing, the, the removing and adding nodes does, the collapsing in the augmentation. Here's the actual function you end up with. These are these funny Stirling numbers we had earlier. Um, now this... It sort of looks complex, but it's all buried in the computer and it all works really quickly. These guys are a, a combinatoric, but we just put them in a table. We're computer scientists. The, we, we can tabulate things, you know, it's really easy to do. The guy who first discovered this method and was, was playing with it, he said, oh no, you can't do this because you can't generate these combinatoric functions quick, fast enough. You know, they're n squared to compute. We said, no, they're not. We put them in a table, they're order one to compute. So, you know, that was one of my first publications. I figured out how to cache a table in statistics. Um, so, this is what we're doing. We've gone from a bunch of probability vectors, non-sparse, to a bunch of count vectors, mostly sparse. And then all of this math is going on underneath. Which is pretty routine. Right, it's so routine that you know, PhD students did this and got a thesis out of it a couple of times. I shouldn't say that, but anyway. Um, so, uh, that's the, the meat of what I'm talking about. Now I'll just run through this stuff quickly just to show you some of these tables and then we'll wrap up. So we're pretty much, um, we've done, this was really the hard bit here. I notice it's getting late, actually. Yeah. Why does it, it, it's dark, it, it seems to be dark really late. Is, are we in August still? Or? It's September. September, just, um, I don't know. You're, n you're not that far north, oh, anyway. Yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking of Helsinki. So, I'll, we'll look at two of the techniques people are using. Right, uh, the, now I'm talking about I've shown you specific examples, now we'll look at some of the more general families here. Um, one of them is something called hierarchical processes, which I'll be talking about in more detail tomorrow. Um, the thing we noticed here is that when people are using these things called Dirichlet processes, that when you're not at the root of the hierarchy, what you actually have is a Dirichlet distribution. And that makes all your math easier. So, one of the big things we're doing is working with these distributions and using statistical results to figure out how to simplify things. Um, I could talk for hours on this one, I'm not going to, I don't think it's important. Uh, but there is a paper that started it off. I, uh, this paper, I think it's got several thousand citations. Um, God, if I had a paper like that, I'd be happy. I could retire somewhere, you know. Um, but I tell my students this is the most important paper you should never ever read because it's way too complex. Oh hell, this has been recorded. I shouldn't say that, should I? Um, no, really, it's, it's, it's an amazing paper. It, it made a huge Im impact, but it's way too complex. I don't think they really understood that what they were doing, actually. To, you, you know when people get too detailed in the math and they don't really figure out that, well, it's just a distribution, there's no process in there, anyway. Um, so, I will skip this, but a lot of the process work we do, it all comes back to this guy called Lancelot James, he's got all the theory, 
Um, but it's buried in statistical papers that uh, very few people can read. So uh, there's sort of a job security thing there. Um, so we figure, we've gone in and figured this out and we know how to use it. Um, so anyway. Um, I'm going to tell you this. This is a story, actually. It's not really that relevant. But I have to tell this story because I find it so funny. Um, it's about this area. So this is a state of LDA. We've seen this graph before in 2008. Um, in towards the late 2000s, coming up to 2010, all the rage in machine learning was doing a a uh, non-parametric version of LDA. Um, there was a lot of papers on this. <coughs> uh, what these guys didn't realise was that the, the lower level below that Dirichlet process is not actually a Dirichlet process, it's just a Dirichlet because the second level of a stochastic process is always a distribution and not a process. Um, so while this was the model they were playing with, in fact it was equivalent to this. And there was very good code for this written back in 2008. So this is the outcome. I, when I first discovered this, I thought it was hilarious. There's all of these papers, really brilliant people, you know, these are great authors, Suttoth, that's a PhD thesis you should read, by the way, really good. David Bly, Michael Jordan, fabulous people. What they didn't realise was all this work they'd done, 2009. Exactly the same problem, but done in Dirichlet's instead of Dirichlet processes. Works a hundred times faster and gives better results than all of these papers. So anyway, that's my story about getting your algorithms mixed up. But the relevance to, the, to us is that once you figure out these stochastic processes and you can put them in your networks, you know how to do it. And there's uh, some groups now in the US that are doing this incredibly well. Um, I'm not sure if I mention the names here. I don't. Um, uh, Texas, uh, Duke University. So they've figured out how to use stochastic processes really well and put them into networks as we're doing here. Um, okay, this is our table. So if we've got a complex function appearing in our things, we look it up. This is the latent variable we augment with and this is the simplification we get. Right? This is our secret table, currently unpublished. But this is how we do all our work. Um, that makes this sort of te these techniques doable. There's another one you may have heard of. It's 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 where you get rid of the logistic. This is the the um, what do they call it? A softmax function, right? This is at the core of a lot of neural networks. So if we're doing this in a probability framework, there's a method that came out in 2013 where we can augment it. And we t convert this function <coughs> with an augmentation into a Gaussian. And then we can do all sorts of things with it. So we've been using that. Now, the only problem with this, it's not going to scale up to the sort of thing that the deep neural network guys do. But for a lot of our problems, it's good. If we're, and especially if we've got sparse Boolean data, it works really well. So that's another example of a recent augmentation that people are using um, that is similar to this. In this case, the function here would be the softmax. And to get rid of a softmax, augment with a polygamma and you get a Gaussian. All right, so that's an example of the, the methods. So the, the stochastic processes in many cases, we know how to do the math for that now. Lancelot James has worked out the general cases and published it all, and it's all easy. Not everyone has got into onto this yet. Um, and 
for many of the other cases, we use this sort of augmenting and we can figure out how to do things. So that's it. Um, that's the, uh, I'm just seeing what time we are. Oh, there we go, a bit early. So as um, some of my colleagues have been telling me, they think, wow, these deep neural networks, one of their secrets is ease of implementation. I was going to say ease of use, but ho hopefully you, if you n use some of them, you'd know this might not be true. There's a lot of magic parameters in some of those algorithms. Um, but implementation of the system usually is done for you automatically. We'd like to achieve the same thing, and we think that's possible. And hopefully I've sketched out to you the things we can do with networks and, and how we can do a lot of this automatically. Um, uh, and how it also works for non-parametric methods. I haven't really covered that, but I kind of threw up the couple of slides there that, that talked about that. Um, but I think the community's ready for this. I know um, uh, a lot of people are, are at about this level. Um, what's unclear to me though is, uh, is where I think the real action is, the really critical stuff, is not so much making our probability networks work on this kind of scale, it's a lot of the critical stuff is actually going to be integrating and working with the current sort of deep neural network models. Because some of those models are just great statistical models, stuff we should be doing. So um, we would like to sort of combine and, and mix as well as what we're doing. Anyway, um, so that's all I have today. Um, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Yep.